if you want to look at it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start this and I'm going to tell you at first what it really was, what it really, really was. They didn't call you by your name. They call you a hammerhead outfit, a thing, an old thing. They called you a nigga. What's good, YouTube? Once again, it's your boy OG Hollywood coming back at you with another edition of the Ferguson Chronicle. Today, I have on the show an individual goes by the name of Mr. Larry Guy Henderson. Larry Guy Henderson was in prison in 1968. And what I father do I let Mr. Larry Guy Henderson introduce himself. My name is Larry James Guy Henderson from West Dallas, Texas. I was a head turnkey, like a guard. I counted the line in and out. Then I gave people jobs that wanted to be like a turn, like a building tender or a turnkey. Building tender the one that ran the tank. Turnkey the one that ran the hallway and the showers that let the officers in and out the doors. So let me ask you something, guy. What year did you enter the hallways of a uh... TDC, and if you don't mind, tell the viewers what unit you was a turnkey on. I went to the, uh, you know, the hallways in 1968. I was a turnkey on the Clemens unit in Brazoria, Texas. I did two years before I became a turnkey. I did two years in the field. In one hole, I was uh, on the lead, the head squad. I picked cotton, corn, alfalfa, and maize. Worked in the silo pit. What was it like picking cotton when you was in prison? Get a view as a, a overview of what was it like picking cotton and how was you treated by the officers and some of the names that you were called when you was in the field? Well, the officer never disrespected me. I picked uh, 200 pounds of cotton every four hours. And uh, I, never got, I never got beat or called a name not me, but the other inmates, they did. They called them niggas. They called them old hammerhead outfit. Well, let me bring this back and tell you this. When I first drove up in the bus, when I first drove up in the bus, it was getting off, and it was getting off the bus. There was 15 of us went to the Clemens unit, and I was about the last one stepping off the bus, and the man looked at me and said, he said, that old yellow outfit gonna be a, he gonna be trouble. Hey, that's what he called me. And from that day on, I never got beat up. I never got whooped. I never got none of that. And I went right on and became the head turnkey. You may not listen, you may not believe in it. You may not understand it, but I rode a horse. I went outside the gate and I didn't have to be counted. I counted the inmates that go to work in the field. Me and the major counted them out the back door. Counted them out the back door and then we counted them out the back gate. Everything, the penitentiary was it wasn't bad to me. It's just one thing that stuck on my mind and stayed with me right today as I talk. 
A friend of mine was came from a chow hall, and he said, "Guy, do you want me to open up that chow door now?" I said, "Yeah, open it up." When he opened the door up, there was another guy named James Guy. That was his real name, James Guy. He came in and went in the shower and hid off in the shower. When Mixon came to the shower and opened the door, because he was the turnkey, when he opened the door and walked in the shower, James Guy jumped out from behind the shower and stabbed him in his heart in his chest. And I never will forgive him. Mixon ran in my face and said, he stabbed me, guy, he stabbed me, man. I said, man, go to the, go down there to the hospital. He broke out running down the hallway and reached for the door and fell in the hall and died right then. And when I got out of the penitentiary, I went to tell his people what happened. Do you know, those people said, don't come in my house, you killed my brother. Your name Guy. I said, what? You killed my brother, your name Guy. And they thought I'm the one that killed their brother. So let me ask this. So what was it like going up and down those hallways on the Clemens unit in 1968? And like, what way are you talking about? And how did inmates interact with other inmates going up and down those hallways in 1968? They acted like they supposed that because they didn't and get their head tore off. Which mean meaning what? They're going to get beat down by another inmate. The other inmate was a turnkey. Explain to the viewers what a turnkey is. A turnkey is just like an officer. You didn't have officers. You had inmates that were officers. They didn't get paid. They were just like officers. They opened the gate, let the line out. They counted the squad with the officer to the back gate. I even had my own horse where I could ride out in the fields and ride all over the field and come in, okay? Now, a building tenant ran the tanks. He did, he counted, he counted the inmates on the tank and gave the, the number of inmates, when he wrote on a piece of paper, he gave it to the, to the officer in the picket. And then the officer in the picket called the major or the captain and told them about it. If you want to look at it, I'm going to start this and I'm going to tell you at first what it really was, what it really, really was. They didn't call you by your name. They called you a hammerhead outfit, a thing, an old thing. They called you a nigger. That's what they call you. So, in 1968, what was the segregation like in prison? On Clemens, it was man mainly blacks. You didn't have, you may have had about a hundred white and about 200 Mexican. All the rest of them people on Clement were black. That was a black unit. Clement was a black unit. And in, in a way it was a violent unit and in a way it was not. It wasn't violent to me, you know, but I've seen, I've seen guys get raped, but I stopped them. When I came in, dude was raping them, I stopped them. Most of the people, they didn't, they didn't, 
come at me to try to do nothing to me because I was a head turnkey. I ran the penitentiary. And the only somebody could talk to me was the warden. I worked for the warden. I didn't work for no officers or nothing. I worked for the warden. At that particular time when you was on the Clemens unit, if you can remember, what was some of the inmates' name at that particular time you was when you was on the Clemens unit? Eugene Mixon, Leandrew, Childs, Floyd Clark, Floyd Mayberry. It was just this there, but that was so long ago I still I have to think about it. And it come to my mind. Is half the guys that were there, they're gone now. So let me ask you this. So, was it a guy out of West Dallas, Texas, by the name of Larry Armstrong? Yes, he was there. Armstrong was there. He was, uh, he got up into the religious thing. He was there, but he wasn't a violent man. If you can remember, uh, by the way, uh, rest in peace, Mr. Larry. That's what they call him, uh, Mr. Larry. Bad. So back then when a man got stabbed in prison, how did all the other inmates react and how did all the officers react? Well, <clears throat> like a guy got stabbed and killed in the pen. They hurry up and locked the other, hurry up and locked the other inmate that did the stabbing, they locked him up. They shipped him off the unit, moved him to another unit. You cannot you, you cannot do any type of stabbing or killing and expect to live. So was it, what back then, was it, was it a lot of stabbing back then? Yes. Everybody had a knife, a gun, a knife, a weapon. They take a, they take a, a, a screwdriver and, and file it down like an ice pick. They take, they, they, they have so many weapons. They have so many weapons. But if one thing about me, I never had a weapon. I never had a weapon. So how did you uh, defend yourself back then? With my fist. With my fist. And I didn't, I didn't have uh, a knife or screwdriver, nothing. But I had something like a a billy club. Oh yeah, the turnkey, the major turnkey, could carry a billy club. The same billy club that they use now. The same in Tennessee. billy club that they use that they walk around. A uh, uh, inmate could turnkeys can carry a billy club in the hallway. They stand in the hallway. When you go in to eat, child, you're going down the hallway on your left-hand side. When you're coming from the child hall, you're coming back on the right-hand side. You can't talk to the inmates going down the hall or coming from the child. If you did, the turnkey was in his right position to grab you and pull you out of line and throw you up against the wall, that means you got a case. Meaning, what kind of, I mean, how would mean I, you got a, an offense, a penitentiary case. Not a case, free will case, but a penitentiary case. That means you got a case. Either you're going to go stand in the hallway all night long. You're not going to eat when they get ready to eat. You're not going to take a shower. You're going to stand in the hallway, facing the wall, till the next morning. Then when the next morning come, 
and they said, all that line get ready. Then you're going to get ready and go down there and catch out in your squad. So in 1968, just so the viewers will know, what were you charged with to send you to prison? What was I charged with? In 1968, that sent you to the Clemens unit. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's not funny. I was charged with robbery. I shot two men. Yeah, I did. I went in a <clears throat> I went in a place, a business, grabbed some suits and ran out the door. The man was running at me. I shot him in the air. He didn't stop. I shot him on the ground. He didn't stop. Kept coming. I shot him. And killed him? Or you? I just shot him. And wounded him? The first, then, then the first one, though, I went in the jury store. I'm looking around. I was a youngster, but I was a hell of a football player. And I had, could have, you know, got the can to the cheese and everything, but I was stupid. I was doing, going back and forward. Uh, it's hard to tell. I think about it all the time. This man was sitting at his desk, <clears throat> and I came in, and he was talking to me, and I pulled a gun out. Told him don't move. He went like he was going in the draw, and I shot him. Grabbed two TVs and ran out the door with him. Went to South Dallas. And at that time, we wasn't it wasn't about cocaine and heroin. It was about drinking syrup. So we were drinking syrup. This guy came, he's dead now. He came up to me and told me what he had stole downtown, and I told him what I just had did. He called, he had a case. He called the police and told them that he wanted to turn himself in, and he is the case that he wanted, if they could give him some leniency on the case, he'll tell you who did it. And that's how I got convicted. He told it on me. He got two years. I went to jury trial, they gave me 50 years. And uh, I got it cut. I got it cut down to 25 years. And my kids, they were babies. And they were crying in the courtroom. And you know, it took me a long, long time to forget what happened and what I did. Okay, when I got out, when I got out of penitentiary, my boys was big. They was growed up then. And do you know, I was driving a truck, working a different thing. And then <clears throat> my wife got killed. And then my mama, my mama died. Got my mama, got no died. When she did, I kind of gave up on my life. I said, fuck that shit. I don't care what they say about me. I ain't working no damn more. And I went right out there and got me a gun and went over there and started doing it. I got caught. Do you know they gave me a probation? And when they let me on probation, I told them that I wasn't going to even report. And I didn't report. And they sent me to Beto unit. And I stayed on the Beto unit three years and got out. When I got out, <clears throat> I changed my whole life around. I started going the other way. And then I started selling dope. 
All right? I started making a lot of money. A lot of money. And all of a sudden, that's even why I tell these people, you can make all the money you want to make, but one day you're going to spend every dime trying to stay free. So let me ask you this. If you can remember, what year did they do away with turnkey and build a tunnel? 19... In 1981, they started hiring lady guards. And they, the guard, the ladies, they never came out of the cell block. They were hiding behind a thing. Okay, do you know one day I was counting, me and a lady was counting the people that was in the solitary that were locked down. And there was a boy, a dude in there had the death penalty. And he was jacking off on the woman when she came around. I told him to stop. He said he ain't stopping nothing because ain't nothing, because his life is over with. And then the lady, I told the lady to get on out and back and get out and back there. All right. Man, let me tell you. Boy, that day, they came to me. A little dude came to me and told me, he said, you made parole. I said, man, get out of my face. I ain't made no parole. He said, yes, you have. They came down to the desk and told me to give them the keys. And I gave them the keys, and they walked me down to the cell block and told me I couldn't come out no more. The uh, only thing I can do is it's come down because they had showers on the cell block. So what, what, what was the reason they say you couldn't come out? Because no they wanted me to go home, and they didn't want me to get in no trouble. They didn't want me to get in no trouble and mess my parole up. So they, that's where they locked me up. Would they do everybody like that? No, they did me like that because I was the head turnkey. I was like a captain or something over all the turnkeys. And right today, as we speak, as right today, people see me on the streets and they say, that guy handsome. There's a turnkey on Clemens. You know, sometimes people have made a little statement about, you ain't on Clemens no more. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Now, it, you know, it's a whole lot of things that so the God, God has really blessed me. There's a whole lot of things that went down. And I'm going to say this for you before we stop. I was going to, I was selling drugs and had my, uh, uh, my wife that I'm with now, that I've been with for 37 years. Okay? Now, I used to leave her at home but I would bring her thousands of dollars every night, all right? I went out in West Dallas, and I got into, I didn't get into it with nobody. Speaking of, speaking of West Dallas, that's where Mr. Larry's from. I know what. Yeah, he's from West Dallas. Okay. And I got, and you know, I'm going to tell you how good, the good Lord is, how good he is. This, this lady asked me to find her daughter for her, that she want her to change your colostomy bag she had on. Okay, I went up looking at the dope house for her and they said she was gone. All right, I went around to some old friends' house, just sitting down, we had a few drinks. And this girl said, I'll go around there and see she around there. I told her, don't go around there. I don't need nobody doing nothing for me. This is my town. I'm West Dallas, in my territory. Nobody can't tell me where to go. So I walked around there, 
when I walked around there, two dudes, I knocked on the door. The dude opened the door, I stepped in. Two dudes came from behind me, and I looked around. One had a shotgun, and one had a machete. Okay? And I, and I said, what's up? The man ain't no Sean in here. So just being being that the dude I am and the man I, you know, I said, excuse me with the expression, but I'm finna say, but I'm finna say it. Uh, these niggas here don't know who they messed with. So I left and got a gun. And when I came back, I went back around there and knocked on that door. And when he opened the door, the dude inside just fired. Boom, fired one shot. When he fired the shot at me, I pulled a 45 and fired, hit him in the neck. Then I fired again. He fell. I hit him on, knocked him on the floor. Then I ran and started shooting the people in the house. All right? And then I came out, came on to my wife over there, told her what happened. She slapped me. Guys, you know, crying. Okay. And then I made, at the time, made bond. My bond was 100000 I made bond. And I stayed out until 2003. In 2003, they came in and they told me <clears throat> they'll give me 10 years. 10 years for, I, I wanted self-defense. They wouldn't give it to me because of my prior conviction. They gave me uh, 10 years. And I was saying, why did they give me 10 years and the man shot at me first? They said if I hadn't went back around now, then, you know, it was, if I, you know, it's just like I went, left there and went, got a gun and came back and killed him. So how much time did you do the first time before you released? I did. On oh, your yeah. first charge when you went first to the First charge on the, well, I got cut to 25. Yeah. I did eight years. Then I did 16 years on parole. And you lived the 16 years down. That's right. As soon as I lived it down, 30 days later, I got a case. And what kind of case was that? I threw a brick through the window. And went back. And threw a brick through the window and ran in now. Got my wife some tennis shoes and ran out the door with them. And went back. Right. And what unit was you put on this time you went back? I'll and what on, year was it? I put on Beto. <clears throat> I think it was 1990, 92 or 91, and I stayed in 94. So when you went back to Beto, you went in 68. No, I went to 68 to Clemens. You went 68 to Clemens. Got out, lived the parole down, and went back. So I guess my question to you is this. When you went back after all those years and you seen the penitentiary had changed, how did you handle that? If, <clears throat> if it had changed so much that there wasn't no pen. It was a little juvenile. Yeah, wasn't nothing. Walk down the hall with your pants hanging all off your ass, bagging pants and, and talking. You got women. You got lady guards right there where it used to be dudes. Running the prison. Running the prison. You got lady guards standing in the hallway with them tight pants on or them little bitty skirts. And they run the prison. So that's what I'm saying. So how did God, after being a turnkey for all those years, process that? When you come from the old school to the new school. I couldn't believe it. And then when I came back, I was working in the shower, in the laundry. 
I wasn't working in the laundry. I was working in the shower. We'd give them clothes after the shower and stuff. It was a lady guard working with me. You know what I'm saying? And she telling you what to do when you used to be telling them what to do. Yeah, but she know what? One day, I was putting some clothes up. Putting some clothes in, you know, like they say, give me box, like your box is box 10. Give me box 10, your clothes. And I was turning around, and the lady was right on the back of me, breathing real hard. You know what I'm saying? And I said, well, what are you doing? You know, but now, I know that I could have had sex with her, but I wasn't, that, that wasn't me. I was ready, to, I, I didn't want to go down like that, you know? The lady guards, about four or five, and gave me their address, phone number, and told me to come back and visit them when I got out. So, but when I got out, they sent me <clears throat> to the walls. And then they sent me on the unit right over here by Cedar Hill. And I stayed over there two years. So let yeah. me ask this. For the viewers, because You've had guys that go to prison in the nineties complaining about going to the fields and picking cotton mm. and doing work in the fields. Tell the viewers how it was on a daily basis when you turned out for work in the fields to pick cotton and how long would you stay in the fields? Like they'll send you to the field at you had to be in the field at 7 o'clock that morning. Okay, now you're going to pick cotton to 5 o'clock. Rain, sleet, or snow. Rain, sleet, or snow. You pick your, you whatever weight you is, that's what you pick. If you weigh 175, you pick 175. And what happens if you don't pick the right amount of cotton? Then you got a case. You got a case. You come in, you stand on the wall. They don't let you eat. You stand there until the next morning. All and night. All night long. Then you catch out again, go to the field, and you have to pick your weight. If you don't, you get back on that wall. Do the same thing. So did y'all ride a trailer to work, walk to work? And sometimes we walk to work. No yeah. matter how far it is. Of course, no matter how far it is. Then sometimes we rode a, a trailer to work. You know what I mean? And, uh, the first one get off is the lead road man and the tail road man. He jump off. When he jump off, well then, then you jump off. He go to he go to the row one. Tail road man go like to row ten. The rest of the squad is in the middle. Okay. Then you get them cotton sacks. And there you go. So who hand the cotton sacks out? Who hand the oh inmate hand them out. Inmate had the cotton sacks out. Would the inmate be on the horse? No, he'd be standing up in the up in the up in the buggy where you empty your sack at. You got an inmate on the horse, but he's a dog boy. Then what was his job? So he had two dogs. And they standing out waiting. If you run, then they send the dogs after you. So during your time going in and out of that back gate, going to them fields, what was it like at the end of the day when y'all coming back in, when it was all said and done? Oh, it was just like you had a construction job. You come in, go straight to the shower, change clothes, go to your tank, they call your, your your tank, and you go eat. You go eat, you come back, you can go to the yard, and then you you can come in and look at TV, they at holler count time. So, how was that living quarter set up? Was it segregated? Did blacks sit with blacks, whites sit with whites, or how was that? You wasn't there, and you just, you don't know, but no. Blacks stayed with blacks. Whites stayed with white. 
Mexican stayed with Mexican. You know what I mean? Now, all of them feared the blacks. That's what, all of them feared the blacks. And why did all of them fear the blacks? They feared the blacks. All of them feared the blacks. So let me ask you, so during your time there on that Clemens unit, was there any segregated rides between any colors? No. So how did y'all handle that? So look over there and then look over there and meet your motherfucking ass back over there. And when we eat, we didn't eat with them. When we went to the wrecking, to the yard for the gentleman's wrecking yard, we didn't go with them. We went with blacks. And black were with blacks. Now, like, if a white man looked at you kind of funny, then he fucking up. What do you mean by that? They coming at him. Was it to fight him, kill him? To kill him. Hey, you disrespecting me. What you looking at me like that for? You ain't going to look at me like that. And if you don't do nothing to them, then they going to sit up there and say, man, let that motherfucker look at you like that. So what would they do to him? Kill him? Jump on him? Yeah, beat the shit out of him. Excuse me for cussing. That's just the way it is. But now, uh, that's how they gonna say it. We gonna get you. When you going to the commissary line and we coming from a child hall, about seven or eight gonna jump your ass. Would it be building to the turnkeys or just regular inmates? Be regular inmates. But the turnkeys gonna come. When the turnkeys come, then it's gonna be a problem. They coming with iron pipes, billy clubs, they're gonna beat, you know, it's gone low power made, low battery. Yeah, now, man, you don't let nobody tell you nothing about that pen, unless they have been now. Can't nobody tell me anything about no penitentiary that happened in 1975, 71, 72, 80, 81, 95. It can't tell me nothing. If you didn't step off that bus in them 60s and looking over at them guards in them 60s and they looking at you, you understand me? And the first thing they're going to tell you, come here, old thing. You old hammerhead outfit. Come here, nigger. Yeah, that's what you were. You know what I'm saying? Now, it, 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 you know, it used to hurt me back then, but after I became, I stayed two years on the turn row. Oh yeah, the way I got off the turn row, I got my leg broke. I got my leg broke. Dude, dude hit me with an Aggie and broke my leg. Was it in an altercation or he just? No. I hit him upside his head because he got on my row. And then when he got on my row, well, I popped him upside his head, okay? And then I promised out there, he didn't hit me with the egg. I knocked that. I hit him, he dropped the egg, and I ran up on him to get him and stepped on the egg and hit me in the face and knocked my gold tooth out and broke my ankle. So what happened then? They put me to like sent me to the hospital and I never went back to the field again. So did you ever see that individual again? No, they shipped him. They shipped him to another unit. You know what? Man, I used to open the doors and let the bosses, the officers, go around and eat. And you know, like, I used to go eat with the officers. And what was that like? It was like I was an officer. Like I was a, I was an inmate with a white uniform on, and my uniform was 
Stars and Am. Stars and Am. Straight up, Stars and Am. Let me ask you this. What was it like for you to go to visit? What kind of restrictions you had on you when you went to visit? I didn't have no restrictions. For the viewers, tell us what was it like. I could go in there. My mama was in there. My two sons and my daughter. And one of my baby boys was crawling all around up on the, the thing. Is that we daddy? That's what he said. You know what I mean? But I, I watched him grow up in the pen. And, uh, Man, I, you know, and when they let me, when I got out to penitentiary, do you know, I don't know, it's kind of funny, but I, in a way, I didn't want to get out. And what was the reason why you didn't want to get out? Because I had it made. I had it made down there, you know? And when I came out here, I had to find a job. You know what I mean? And all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I made it. So let me ask this. Here it is, 2022. Mm -hmm. What was some of the things you regretted? I regretted I had, the, the only thing I can re regret is I had to leave my kids. The rest of them, I had to leave my kids and my wife behind. The rest of them, I don't regret none of them. You know? And, you know, I've seen the dude that told it on me. When I saw him, when I got out and I saw him, and I told him, but he started crying and told me he had never been okay. He just blah, 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 just started running his head. I wanted to do something to him, but I just held off. But, man, uh, if you ain't talked to no no dude and been to the penitentiary in them 50s and 60s, 70s, he ain't been to no pen. He been to a playground. That's all they do is play and talk shit, and talk to the, holler at the lady the guards and stuff. You ain't went down there with that man come out there with a whip, gonna tell you get your ass out, he gonna have a whip, and tell you take your shovel and whoop, the, whoop you all in your back. You know, and then he'll kick you in your face, kick your eye, you know what I mean? Ain't nothing they'll do to them. Ain't nothing they'll do to them. That's the why I'm telling you, man, can't nobody tell me nothing about no penitentiary. So let me ask you this. Once again, real life stories, real life people, Ferguson Chronicle, an exclusive interview with Mr. Larry Guy Henderson. So let me ask you this. If you had any advice for any one person that's still in the streets, if you had any advice to those people to try to save them from prison, what would your advice be? My advice be to tell them this here. Don't worry about how much money he making and you make this because you working, he ain't making. Remember this. Remember this, and it's gonna happen. It makes no difference how much money you make, you gonna spend every damn dime trying to stay free. You know what I mean? You gonna spend every dime trying to stay free. You know? Coming to you live, an exclusive interview for Mr. Larry Guy Henderson. This is the Ferguson Chronicle. Mr. Larry Guy Henderson is the father of OG Hollywood. Coming to you live.
Real Live People, Real Live Stories. Mr. Larry Guy Henderson is the father of OG Hollywood. Salute. <laughs>